Good morning, GCA family. Uh, the scripture reading will be taken from Matthew 19, verse 1 through 12. That's Matthew's 19, 1 through 12. And reading, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judah to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it unlawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it is not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, is it better not to marry? Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom, who, whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. Others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Let us now pray for those who are standing in the need of prayer. And right, no, Lord, we are all in need of prayer, and your servant needs your help. Lord, as I seek to share what you have shared with me, might your Holy Spirit take hold and rivet home your message to each heart. And we ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. Jake and Jesse were both 92 years old when they found each other and decided to get married. One day they were strolling, the 92-year-old lovebirds were strolling, discussing their wedding plans, and they just happened to pass by a, a drugstore and decided to go in. So Jake told the pharmacist, he said, uh, you know, we're getting married and um, I, I just want to know, do you sell heart medication? <laughs> the pharmacist said, of course we do. He, he said, uh, what about medication for circulation? Oh, I have that too. What about for rheumatism and lumbago? Oh, definitely. He says, how about Viagra? Oh, yes, so we have that too. Do you have medicine for memory problems and arthritis and jaundice? Yes, I have that. Uh, what about wheelchairs and walkers and scooters? Do you have those? He says, yes, we have all speeds and all sizes. <laughs> that does it, said Jake. We'd like to register for our wedding gifts right here. <laughs> Today we're starting a series entitled God's Design for Marriage. And regardless of your age or your marital status, this series is designed with you in mind. Regardless of your age, and even though it says God's Design for Marriage, singles, this series is for you. Married couples, this series is for you. Widows, divorced, regardless, this series is for you. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Somewhere along the line, I believe God has a message uh, for each of us as we go through the next four messages together. 
marriage, they say, is like a castle under attack. You know what happens when a castle is under attack? Most of the people inside want to get out. And most of the people outside want to get in. <laughs> In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verses, verse number 3, Jesus is approached by some of those who are trying to get out. And verse 3 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, the Pharisees came to Jesus and asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Man, these guys really wanted to get out. For any and every reason, so much for romance. I'm convinced that one of the reasons that so many marriages are breaking up, the reason so many who are on the inside of the castle are trying to get out, I honestly believe it's because there are some myths about marriage that some of us have. And I believe because of some of these myths, some of us are trying to get out. And so this morning, I want to just share with you uh, three myths about marriage and see what God has to say to us. Let me just say, by the way, before I get going, that there is a, some, during the series, we're going to be making some resources available. And one of the first resources we have is something here entitled, 100 Things to Know When Dating. There's a lot you need to know when you're dating. And uh, it's a 16-page uh, 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 pamphlet, and I'm going to suggest that those of you who are single, uh, you may want to get one. It's only $1. Brother Carson will have them at the book cart later on, and if he runs out, we'll get more uh, for you next week. But just a dollar and, uh, for that 16-page pamphlet. 100 things to know when dating. Myth number one, Marriage is God's ultimate plan for everyone. Some people believe that marriage is God's ultimate plan for everyone. That God would prefer if all of us got married. There is this idea lurking around. And I want to say that sometimes it's even in churches where this idea that God wants everybody to get married exists. And so there's a pressure for marriage. Oh, some of us, we have an internal pressure. Oh, we, we're so anxious to get married. And then sometimes it's the married folks trying to pressure the single folks to get married. The, the funny part is that sometimes the married people who are trying to encourage you to get married, they ain't getting along. They got all sorts of marital problems, but they're trying to push you into it. And it's like misery is looking for company. I'm going to suggest, my friend, that we stop harassing people about getting married. Because, listen, God's ultimate plan is to conform us to the image of Christ. Did you get that? God's ultimate plan is to conform us to the image of Christ. Romans 8.29 tells us that God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Somehow he's going to get us there. Whether you like it, listen, God has already marked it down that now that you are a Christian, you are going to end up looking back like Jesus Christ one way or the other. That is what he's determined to do. He's not, he's not determined to get you married or me married. He's determined to get us looking like Jesus. And for some of us, the best way to get us there is through marriage. Oh, you, you didn't know that marriage sometimes is a, is a process to make you what you're supposed to be. You better believe marriage is full of stress and strain. And, and sometimes the best way God chisels you down is through marriage. Sometimes the best way he sandpapers you is through marriage. Because he's determined to get you to look like Jesus. Oh, you thought marriage was to make you happy. For some of us, he gets us there through singleness. And later on in the series, we're going to talk a little bit more about singleness. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about how, how do you choose that mate. But, but, but suffice it to say, God's plan is not primarily about your getting married. 
God's plan is really to make you look like Jesus. Amen? The myth that marriage is God's ultimate plan for everyone causes us though. It's a serious mistake because it makes us miss the fact that God actually, the Bible actually seems to suggest, don't miss this, that there are some people who probably should not be getting married. Oh, you, you said this is sort of strange teaching here. The Bible suggests that there are some folks who need to approach marriage with caution. Here are four of the reasons why you should approach marriage with caution. Number one, you may need to approach marriage with caution because of physical challenges. Now, I don't remember ever sitting in a service and hearing a message on this verse, but here we go. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse number 12. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Some are eunuchs because they were made that way by men. You say, Brother Brian, I never heard about this eunuch. Who is a eunuch? Well, a eunuch is someone who was castrated. A man who has been castrated. Castrated males are those who are incapable of reproduction due to a birth defect. And the Bible, Jesus is saying, as he talks about marriage and divorce, he introduces the fact that there are some who should be cautious about getting married because they are eunuchs, whether because they were born that way or they were made that way. You see, in, the, in, the, in olden days, they, they would intentionally castrate men to induce impotence and remove sexuality. No, it was a common practice, particularly for the man who took care of the king's harem. Though you can understand. Do, do I need to explain that? So, so, so if you're going to be in charge of 100 beautiful ladies, the best thing to do is to castrate the man. It removes all sexual temptation. And so the Lord Jesus is telling you, remember in fact in the story of Queen Esther, the Bible makes it clear that the person who was taking care of the, of the harem there, the, 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 the king's court, was this eunuch. Here's the point. There are people who are physically challenged in the area of sexual, sexual intimacy. Some may have been born that way, and some may have become uh, uh, sexually uh, incapable because involuntarily, sometimes because of medical reasons. Now, it's very rare in our generation, in our day, that castration is being practiced, although in some foreign countries it is being practiced. But you'd hardly see that happening in, in most of the, the Western countries. But, but, but sometimes there are medical reasons which makes someone incapable in this particular area. And, and, and what God, Jesus Christ seems to be suggesting, if you are in that situation, you should approach marriage with caution. Make sure. I'm trying to be as practical as I can be because I'm finding as I prepare for this message that the Bible is as practical as you get. We run away from, this thing is full of practical instruction and it is telling us, listen, if you have sexual challenges, you need to make sure that before you rush and talk about getting married, that you disclose these issues to the person that you're talking to, lest you defraud this person. It's nothing to be ashamed of, by the way. This is nothing to be ashamed of. If I was born that way or medically I became that way, it's nothing to be ashamed of. But listen, it might mean that I might not be the best candidate for marriage and at least I need to have an open discussion of where I am in this area. Amen? Number two. The second reason why some folks should approach marriage with caution and, and, and so this is why these myths that God wants everybody married is so damaging. Because listen, we miss this, that some should not marry because of a spiritual commitment. 
In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 12, Jesus go on to say, as he talks about some have been born eunuchs, and he says some have been made eunuchs by men, he goes on to say, others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. Don't miss that. No, 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 somehow I've been a Christian a long time and, and often all I, I, I sense is a push that everybody should get married and yet Jesus is seeming to say, my friend, young person and older one, whether you, what, I'm talking to singles here, Jesus seems to be saying to some of us who are single, listen, there's another option and it's celibacy because I want to serve God and his kingdom. Kingdom. Don't miss that. You say, are you crazy? I, I, are you really for real? Yes, I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying it. Jesus is saying that one of the options we should consider as singles is whether we should be single so we can serve God. You say, but Brother Brian, isn't it easy to serve God if you're married? You know that Paul was not married. Do you know John the Baptist was not married? And you know, if you study the scriptures, some of the men who God used so mightily were not married at all. In fact, here's what Paul says. And can we jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7? We're going to stay there just for a minute or two. Actually, we may be a little longer than you expect. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And um, let's see what Paul has to say about this issue, um, about, sir, about being single because of a spiritual commitment. And so in verse number one, here's what Paul says, something that may shock some of you. He says, that's not 1 Corinthians, that's 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number one. Paul says, no, for the matter I wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Uh, is, does your Bible read that way? Yours may say, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Amen? Amen. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Let's jump down to verse number 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So you said, Brother Brian, I, 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 can't I serve God better if I'm, if I'm married? And the Apostle Paul seems to be saying no. The Apostle Paul say it, it, it is better to stay single if you're going to burn with passion. However, listen, it, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And you said, but Brother Brian, why? Read verse, jump to the verse number 32 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 32 tells us there, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Are you getting that? Listen, do you know I do you know I cannot jump up and say to my wife, Cheryl, um, I think I'm gonna to go to Africa for six weeks to preach. As much as she's such a sweet sister and you love her so much, I want to tell you it would be drama at two sergeant court. <laughs> if Brother Grant just decides, I'm going to Africa for six weeks, see you. It, 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 it just doesn't work that way. I, I, I have got to be concerned about pleasing my mate. Let, let, let me just pause here and make an application of these verses. Because this, these verses are saying something to those of us who are married. And these verses are saying something to us who are single. And I don't want us to miss this, what is being said. Listen good, if you are married, God is telling you your focus should be on how to please who? 
If you are married, your focus has got to be on pleasing your, your mate. Stop. Is that, are you really focused on that Mr. and Mrs. whatever? Are you really focusing on pleasing your mate? Or are you more focused on pleasing yourself? We, we need to be honest with this. And Jesus is trying to get, God wants you to understand if you are married, it's not about you. You see, this is where the devil wants us to so focus on pleasing ourselves. And guess what happens? When I focus on pleasing myself, nobody ends up being pleased. It's the funniest thing. I am trying to please myself. He is trying to please, she is trying to please herself. And none of us end up any better off. But my, 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 what would happen? What a transformation would happen if I would really seek to please my wife in every single thing. And my wife would try to, can you imagine how pleased we both would be? <laughs> you see all these brothers and sisters walking. <laughs> I need to ask those who are not married. What does it say about the unmarried? The unmarried, what is their focus? To what? To please the Lord. Oh, don't throw stones at me. I know it's always a danger when a married man talks to single folks because what do you know? You, you married already. <laughs> I don't have to worry because I'm telling you what God says. God is saying, listen, if you're single, you ought to be focused on pleasing the Lord. And the problem we have in many churches is that the individuals who are single, because of this myth that God wants everybody married, Everybody is so focused on getting married that the singles forget that your duty is to be focused on pleasing the Lord. And I need to ask you, my friend, as a single, a teenager, a young adult, I need to ask you, what are you focused on? Are you focused on pleasing God? Is that what drives you? Is that your real motivation? You see, people are waiting here. Here's what I find out. I've been around a while. I ain't great for nothing. <laughs> and I find out that young people tend to wait till they're married and settled down before they're willing to focus on pleasing the Lord. But by the time they're ready to focus on pleasing the Lord, that's not what they should be focusing on. By then they should be now focusing on pleasing their mate. And I need to let you realize, my friend, young people, older ones, if you're single, you need to, this morning, if that's not where you are right now, you need to say to God, God, I want to serve you with an undivided focus. Listen, you will never, single person, you will never have as good an opportunity to please the Lord and to serve the Lord with an undivided heart as you have right now. Do you understand that you will never have another opportunity to serve him with such an undivided heart as you have right now? And so it is good if this morning we would make a commitment and we would say to God, you can have me, Lord. You can use me, Lord. But secondly, I need to move on because I've only gotten to two so far of the reasons. Number one, because, as I said, number one, because of physical challenges. Number two, because of a spiritual commitment. But number three, because of emotional wiring. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 7. And the words of God says there, verse 7, he says, uh, I wish that all men were as I am. And Paul says something very interesting. He says, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift and another that. What the Apostle Paul, if you read it in its context, the Apostle Paul is trying to get across, some of us have the gift of marriage and others have the gift of singleness. Amen? God has emotionally wired some of us that we're just fine by ourselves. There's some folks who don't need, need a mate in their space. 
They're not boiling over with sexual passion. They can manage quite fine single. God has wired them that way. You know, sometimes we make people feel funny if that's the way they are. Or they may feel funny because of this world. Everything is about sex, sex, sex. Everything you turn on is about... Uh, 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 and, and you need to realize that God is telling you that he has wired some of us with the gift of singleness. Here is the danger of this myth that God wants everybody married. If God has wired you with the gift of singleness and you're rushing ahead to get married, you will put drama in somebody's life. You say, how you mean? You will frustrate somebody. You are going to frustrate somebody if you have the gift of singleness, not the gift of marriage, and you rush into getting married, married because that's what everybody does. You are going to frustrate somebody. You might frustrate them when you get married because you might get there because along the way you're going, you may have already frustrated them so, so much. that. Uh, the, so listen. Well, let me move on. Nancy DeMoss says this. Nancy DeMoss is an author and radio host of over a thousand, on over a thousand stations. And she said, as she wrote about the gift of, she says, there is no greater giver than God himself. When God gives us a gift, he's pleased. Listen, when God gives us a gift, don't miss this if you're, if, if, if you think you have this gift. Listen, listen to what she said. When God gives us a gift, he is pleased when we thank him for it and use it for its intended purpose. And then she goes on, she says, I am not single by accident. I am single because God has chosen for me the gift of singleness. Number four. Some people ought to be cautious about getting married because of unnatural desires. Turn with me in Romans to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And the word of God says there, Because of this God gave them over to shameful loss. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Listen, I don't really care what the society says. I, I, I don't care what the president says. I don't care what the judges say. I, I don't care what legislatures say. The only thing I care about is what God said. Amen. And God said that there are these unnatural desires. They are not natural. I spoke to a pastor a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me about a couple who came to him for, him, for help. And their 13-year-old daughter uh, came to them because she was so hurt. She, she was struggling. She didn't want to go to school. And so uh, he, he, the, the parents, what is, honey, what's wrong? Uh, well, the little 13-year-old said, Mom, uh, my, my, my friends are all mocking me because they say I am the only girl in the class that's not by." Uh, and so, of course, poor mom, she was so not in tune with the realities of what's going on. And mom said, what do you mean by about being bi? She said, mommy, I'm bisexual. I'm the only one that's not bisexual. Thirteen years old. And these kids of 13 years old have done enough experimentation that some of them seem to believe that they are bisexual. My friend, young person, and listen, we are, as leaders, we are very much aware of the society we're living in, and we know for sure that some of our young people are being impacted by what's going on in the society. 
And I want you to write this date down because at our next Sunday night connection, which is March the 23rd, I'm going to be interviewing a young lady who was a practicing homosexual for 19 years. Now we're going to have a separate uh, 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 area for some of the smaller children. So some of you who want to be here but you don't want your little children to be a part of this discussion, you're free to do that. But we hope you'll at least allow your teenagers and the older preteens to be in this discussion because we believe that the young people need to be aware that listen what they're saying here's what the society is telling us the society is telling us that you were born that way and you cannot change and by the mercy of God this young lady is here to tell us listen not only was she not born that way she was trapped by the devil and now God has freed her amen <laughs> March 23rd, 7 p.m. for the Sunday night connection. Listen, listen, my friend, young person, young person, and I'm not, we're not, we're not pretending like these things don't happen because we have seen it happen. We have seen it happen in our, in our own church. Young people who have unnatural desires who get married. If you have unnatural desires, you should not get married until you resolve them. And I'm here to tell you just like how God resolved it for this young lady, he can help you resolve, the, resolve it, but you must reach out for help and you can be helped. Let us know, let us know how we can help you. I remember one of the men in my own wedding party. Because you see, unfortunately, sometimes people believe that if I'm a Christian and I have unnatural desires, if I get married, marriage, marriage will cure me. One of the guys in my, one of my, one of my groomsmen in Bible school preparing himself to serve God with his whole, whole life. And his girlfriend, she is there preparing God, uh, herself in Bible school to serve the Lord full time. But she had some unnatural desires that she thought marriage would cure. <coughs> they got married. You realize where she was? She was in Bible school. She was spiritual, apparently. Listen, young person, or older person, if you're struggling in this area, don't try and put it under the cover. Come and deal with it and allow God to help you. She devastated both their lives. Both their lives. Both their lives devastated uh, through marriage. So listen, all I'm saying to you is that unlike what we say, this myth that everybody needs to get married is, is a very serious myth because this myth can cause people who ought to be cautious where God is raising a red flag, it may cause you not to notice there's a flag. Myth number two. Marriage is essential to make me complete. Myth number two, marriage is essential to make me complete. Some people think unless I'm married, until I'm married, I'm only a half a cookie. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a half a Oreo cookie and not even the side that has the cream. <laughs> They're in bad shape, eh? The wrong side of the Oreo cookie. So they are waiting on Mr. Right or Miss Right to complete them because marriage is essential uh, to make me complete. And while some people, uh, singles are waiting to, to get married, the, some of the marrieds are thinking the exact opposite. And one, one man said to his wife, I never knew what happiness was until I married you. Now it's too late. <laughs> The, listen, the danger of this myth is that folks end up blaming all their problems on their singleness. If you're lonely, it's because you're single. If you lack purpose and direction, it's because you're single. If you're emotionally unstable, it's because you're single. If you're sexually frustrated, it's because you're single. I need a man. Not me. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I got what I need. <laughs> so some folks go on the hunt trying to bring this curse to an end. 
Have you ever heard of the Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome? The Bride of Frankenstein Syndrome. You see, this, this happens when a, a young lady hits an age where she's no longer looking for Mr. Right. Any marginally acceptable male will do. Just give him the breath test to make sure he's alive. And so what happens sometimes, someone drags some spiritually dead person into church and try and hope that the leaders of the church will pump some spiritually, spiritual life into this dead soul. If you ask her if she's, he's saved, or if you ask the guy if he... You know, I, by the way, I'm going to come here another week, but let me just say this. It blows my mind when sometimes some party say, Oh, I'm in love, I'm in love. How long you've known her? Six months. I'm in love. Is she saved or is he saved? I don't know. I believe so. <laughs> he almost saved. He almost saved. Lord have mercy. He almost saved. You ever heard of a woman who's almost pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> she either pregnant or she ain't pregnant. Amen. <laughs> he either saved or he not saved. My friend, this myth, this myth, this myth, this myth that I'm not complete until I am married has caused a lot of people to make the mistake of marrying an unsaved person. You better believe it. Because some folks say it's better to marry an unsaved man than to be by yourself. B. Sam Hart, who started this church, was a pilot. He had a couple accidents. One time he landed a plane in a swimming pool. <laughs> it was a crash landing, okay? So, so, so when he said this, he knows what he's talking about. He knew what he was talking about. And, and here's one of the things he said years and years ago uh, that I have not forgotten. forgotten. He said, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than to be in the air wishing you were on the ground. And then he went on to say, it's better to be single hoping someday to be married than to be married hoping to be single. I remember one of my cousins back in Jamaica, she, she said to us, she said, you know, she was, she was, she was going to marry an unsaved man and we, we challenged her about it. And she said, she said, Brian, I know he's not saved and I know God is going to punish me, but I'm willing to deal with that. And I thought, whoa, this is a serious thing, you know. When you actually say, I know God is going to punish me for disobeying, but I am willing to deal with that. I would not be quite that bold because I don't quite know what punishment he's going to send my way. So my friend, I encourage you. You are, listen, listen, listen. You are complete in Christ apart from any romantic relationship you'll ever have. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You are complete in Him. If you are a hunt for somebody to make you complete, stop. Because listen, here's, here's the reality. And I speak to both the singles and to the marrieds. If you as a single person are looking for somebody to complete you, stop! Because you will suck that person dry. You know, even some married folks, they are so needy. They suck all the life out of their mate. You and I need to grow up and accept what Christ has done in us. Amen? You are complete. My friend, if you're not sure, listen, you can grow in Christ. Grow in Christ. Accept your singleness right now, this period of singleness. 
and grow, grow, grow. Become, become the person God wants you to be. Enter, listen, so that if it is God's will that you be married, enter married, marriage with wholeness, emotional stability, not an emotional half an Oreo cookie. Amen? Amen. But third myth that we want to touch on before I shut down this message today. Marriage is doomed if you marry the wrong person. That's the third myth that we want to de deal with today. Marriage is doomed if you marry the wrong person. You know, perhaps as you've listened to some of what I've said, you, you may be thinking that you should not have married. Probably you say, you know what, I'm, I think I have the gift of singleness. Or you may say, I probably married the wrong person. Well, here's the reality. You better not go home to your spouse and say, I think I married the wrong person. <laughs> because even, listen, listen, listen. Because even if you think you married the wrong person, even if your marriage seems hopeless, God can turn it around. No, no, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to pretend. Some people have made some terrible choices about who they married. Can, can we agree on that? Some people have made some terrible choices. And listen, if you made a terrible choice, it's going to be a little harder. You see, Sometimes you, we, 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 we pretend as if it's somebody forced you to marry this person. Well, I knew that once upon a time we used to talk about shotgun weddings, but I, I haven't heard too many shotgun weddings anymore. I'm sure there may be a shotgun wedding here or there, but most of them are... You see, nobody usually forced you to get married. So if you made the wrong choice, you made the wrong choice. Amen? And so all I'm saying is that you need to realize that you need to exercise a little more patience and grace... Don't expect this thing to be like the microwave that you give it 35 seconds and the marriage is now boiling hot. It's going to take perhaps... I don't know. But what I know, here's what I know. Here is what I know that God can turn it around. I want if you, I want, I, 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 let me just, let's stop there for a minute. I want to speak to somebody here today who, who are struggling and you're almost at the point of giving up because that's what this myth does. This myth makes people give up. You realize that? The myth that if I marry the wrong person, my marriage is doomed, it makes me give up. Because what this myth is saying, no matter how hard you try, nothing can really happen because she is the wrong person or he is the wrong person. You married the wrong person and you can work till your eyes are blue or green or whatever. Nothing is going to change. And I'm saying that is being placed in your mind by the evil one because God is saying, I can do it. In fact, in fact, in fact, there may be somebody here this morning who is divorced. You may be divorced. If you or the other person has not remarried, I want you to know that there is still hope. You say, but, but, but we already went to the judge. I don't care if you went to the judge. As far as God is concerned, he still recognized your vow. And I'm saying to you that there is still hope if you are willing to go God's way. Listen, and I'm going to come back to this in, uh, later on in our series. But you know, a survey was done. A survey was done uh, uh, where they took a look at people who, who had rated their marriage. They, had given, they made couples rate their marriage on a scale of 1 to 10. And... A number of couples rated their marriage a 1 out of 10. By the way, 1 was the, not the good side, okay? 1 is mean it couldn't get any worse. So these people, are, five years later, they went back and resurveyed those who had stuck together. Now some who rated it a 1 walked away. 
But many stayed. Five years later, they went back to the folks who had said their marriage was a one out of ten. Can you imagine that five years later, the majority who had rated their marriage a one out of ten now rated it an eight out of ten? He said, Brother Brian Howe, you got to keep coming back to the series. <laughs> keep coming back and you're going to hear how God can turn a 1 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. You know, Hosea married the wrong person. His, his situation could hardly be worse. His wife left him and was sleeping around. And everybody in town knew that Hosea's wife was a local girl. There was no hope for this marriage. And I want to suggest that most of our marriages, if you think your marriage is in trouble, I have a feeling it's not quite as bad as this. I don't think your husband or your wife, even if they maybe have been unfaithful, I don't think they're sleeping around where everybody knows what's going on. But look at Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Hosea chapter 3 is going to be up on the board, and we'll just read it here. I'm reading it in the, in the message translation, just to make it plain, okay? Uh, and he said, here's what the Bible says. The Lord said to me, start all over. Love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend. Your cheating wife. Sounds like a soap opera. Love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. I did it. Hosea said, I had to pay money to get her back. And I told her, from now on, you are living with me. No more whoring. No more sleeping around. You are living with me. And I am living in you. With you. You know what saved that marriage? Hosea was committed to obeying God. Listen. Some of you are struggling. You may know people who are struggling. Help them understand that with Jesus Christ there is hope. If they will obey God. You say, this, this could take a message by itself, but I'm just going to give you three quickies to hold on to. If that's where you are, listen. And even if you're divorced, here are three quickies. Number one, commit to the permanence of marriage. Listen, nothing is going to happen if you don't commit to the permanence of marriage. That's number one. Commit to the permanence of marriage. Go home and let your spouse know, I will never leave you. I am with you. I'm committing to you for life. That's where it starts. You see, when things go bad, here's what we do. The first thing we said, if you don't straighten out, I'm going to leave. That's a bad environment for healing to take place. No healing is going to take place where there's this emotional instability. Listen, healing takes place. We're the first thing. You know, one of the things that I think uh, made me, uh, uh, made most of us who, who, who had good parents, one of the things the parents made you realize is that you will always be welcome. Did, am I right about that? That no matter, did anybody had parents like that? Parents who made you know you are always going to be loved no matter what you did I hope by God's grace that's what we communicated to our kids that no matter what you ever do we will still love you and, and listen that's when good things can happen and good things can happen in a marriage when a spouse knows that no matter what happens I am committed I'll stay but second it's not only committing obeying God not only is committing to permanence it means committing cultivating a heart of forgiveness oh we don't have time to talk about that you're going to have to go, go back over some of the messages we preach a lot of messages on forgiveness go over some of them cultivate a heart of forgiveness because there's going to be a whole lot of stuff to forgive and do the things third do the things that love requires do the things that love requires 
You don't feel like giving her something, give it to her. Speak the nice word, not a harsh word. Oh my goodness, that's a message in itself. Do the things that love requires. My wife told me a story. And I'll tell you this, I'm done, just about, I'm done. I'm really finished, just going to wrap up. But let me just share this story with you. Let me share it with you another Sunday. But let me just share this. She was telling me about this, um, this gentleman who was in, uh, he joined the military. He joined the military and um, the, his commander, his military commander, his military commander, it's a black guy, this important part of the story. It was an African-American young man joined the military. This was years ago, I guess, during the Vietnam War or, or sometime long ago. Uh, and so he, he, he joined the military and his, um, it may have been pre-Vietnam, I don't remember the story so well, I'm talking off the cuff here. Um, but here's the key. His, his captain was a, a Ku Klux Klan, KKK. And the captain, made, made, the man in charge told him right up, I just want you to know how I feel about you and you can fill in the bank. He said, if I get a chance, I'm going to shoot you if I get a chance. And so the story goes on. And by the way, this is a true story. And the story went on. Eventually, they were in some particular gun battle and the, uh, the captain or the, his, whatever the man in charge of him was, whatever his rank, uh, was seriously wounded. And the, this young man, this African-American man who was so hated, did the thing that love, and in their case, duty, but it was more than duty here. He took the man, took incredible risk to himself, went behind enemy lines, they went round and round and round, and eventually took this man. And the whole time, here's the part that I was amazed as my wife was recounting the story to me. The whole time he's carrying the man. The man is cursing him. You little blue, 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 blue. He is cursing the man to the ground. And all through that cursing, he is still carrying this man. Oh, I wish sometime when our spouses say a mean thing and curse at us instead of railing for railing. Oh my God, help you, my friend. Don't give railing for railing. If you're committing, if you're committing to healing and committing to permanence and committing to forgiveness, when you are railed on, do like Jesus, do not rail back. And this young man did not rail back. He continued to do the thing that love requires and he got the man to safety. And so now here we are over the years this man has risen to the rank the african-american has risen in very high in the army my wife thinks it was brigadier general but whatever it is he has now risen in a very high rank in the army and he's going around the country he's making speeches and here he's in the south one day and he's giving a speech and as he gets up to speak a man interrupts an old man and he comes with his walking stick and people are really a little bent out of shape and irritated that this man has interrupted and so the man finally comes forward and he said to them, he said, I just need to tell you that this man uh, uh, was, in my, was in my group in the military uh, and I did everything I could to him. I cursed him. Uh, I did everything. And, and he told them the story. And he said, he turned to the man and he said, would you please forgive me? You have no idea what could happen in your marriage. If you started doing the things that love requires. My Bible says love. It puts coals of fire on somebody. Somehow love is able to melt a heart of stone. My God help you. My friend. I just want to close with this. Here's something that's not a myth. There's going to be a wedding in heaven. Did you know that? There's going to be a wedding in heaven. We talked about some myths. This is not one. There is going to be a wedding in heaven where Jesus Christ is married to his church 
all those of us who know Jesus as Savior. And I want to say, my friend, the best marriage. Some of you have had good marriages. If you think you've had a good marriage, the joy from a good marriage is nothing to be compared to the joy that we're going to have in heaven. I'm glad I'm going. Are, are, you glad, are you glad you're going there? Are you glad you're going to be a part of that marriage? What a joy! Just over 38 years ago, I stood at the altar with a young lady by the name of Cheryl Angela Hart. Stood in front of a minister. Had to have been her father. And the minister asked her an important question. The minister said to her, Cheryl Angela Hart, will you take this man, Brian Hugh Grant, to be your lawful wedded husband? And she said, I will. That moment, Cheryl Angela Hart became Cheryl Angela Grant. A question like that is being asked today. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, here is the question. Will you have this man, Jesus Christ, to be your Savior and your Lord? Let me tell you this. If you say, I will, that moment, you become a Christian. The very moment, it, it, it's not a process, you know. In case you think it's a process, young person, older one, it's not a process. The moment you say to Jesus, I will have you, to be my personal savior. That minute, you become a child of God. That minute, we will become ready for heaven. And as I close, I'm going to ask you, will you say to Jesus? Or you may have said, I will or I do to your spouse. But will you say, I will to Jesus? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there a person like that here this morning? As you search your heart, you're honestly not sure if you're saved. You're really not sure. But Jesus is knocking and he's saying, hey, I want to save you. I want to make you ready for heaven. I wonder if this morning you will say, I will. Jesus, I will. I will receive you. Will you do that? And if you're doing it, we want to pray for you. If, if, if you're doing that, if you're doing that, raise your hand right now. If you're doing that, raise your hand right now. By raising your hand, you're saying, Brother Brian, pray for me. I am accepting Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Is there somebody like that who will say, yes, I want Jesus to be my Savior today. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't matter your marital status. If you say yes to Jesus, he will receive you. And he will change you. Anybody like that? Let me give you one final. Yes, I see that person. Let me just give you one last point here. As you have your head bowed and your eyes are closed. I just want to say this to you. Why don't you talk to God right now? You know, if you're married, you need to talk to him. Because let's be honest, married folks, most of us are not really focusing on pleasing our mate. Could you stop right now and say, God, help me. Help me that it won't be so much about me. It will be about my mate. Stop and talk to him. If you're single, talk to him. Say, God, I must confess, I've been, I haven't really been focusing on pleasing you. And I'm now seeing in your word that during my period of singleness, that's where I ought to be focusing. I ought to be focusing on pleasing you. Talk to God about it. Could be that you're in a marriage that's struggling. Wouldn't you talk to God right now and say, God, we're struggling so much, but I just thank you for the hope you've given me this morning.
to let me know you can turn it around and I'm going to commit to obeying you. I'm going to commit to obeying you. Talk to God. I'm going to give us a little time. Each person in the quietness of your heart, you talk to God and make your commitment to him. And Father, we just thank you that indeed you are the potter and we are the clay. We thank you that you can mold us and make us after your will. And Lord, that's exactly what you're asking us to do for that person who needs salvation. Cause that before they leave here, they may be helped to make that decision for Christ. And for the rest of us, as we stay in our, the silence of our own hearts, and make our dedications to you. Please help us that as a result of our decisions and dedications today, we won't be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.